Well, good morning, everyone. What a wonderful day to uh, be at church. Nice rainy day. Nobody, nobody has anywhere to be. Um, it's always scary when the pastor says that, right? But uh, I promise I won't be too long-winded today. Um, but I am doing um, a two-sermon series. I preach this Sunday and next. Um, it's just kind of how things uh, had to be switched around. And um, I found, wound up here preaching two sermons in a row. So I said, why not, why not do a series? So that's what I'm going to be doing, part one. Uh, I know there's some visitors here today, so you just have to come back next Sunday for, uh, for part two. So there was a man that was walking down the street. Um, he was in a big city, and he came upon this big construction site. Uh, bulldozers, um, earth movers, maybe there were some skid loaders there, Reed. Um, but it was a busy work site, and as he walked past the work site, he saw these three men digging in the ditch. He asked the first man, you know, hey, what are you doing? And he said, I I'm digging a ditch. I said, okay. Asked the second man, hey, what, what are you doing? He said, I'm digging this ditch. We need to put a water line from that building to this new building that's going to be built over here. And he asked the third man, you know, what are you doing? He said, we're building a cathedral. It's going to be the biggest, be most beautiful cathedral. It's going to seat 500 people. It's going to have five big tall spires with stained glass on them. It's going to be the most beautiful church in the city. So that's what he said he was doing. I think a short story illustrates the importance of having a plan set in place, but also the importance of casting that vision. You know, which of these workers um, was going to be motivated and focused on what he was doing? Obviously the guy who was building this cathedral. You know, the guy in the ditch, he's just digging a ditch. That's not a whole lot of fun. But the guy that's looking at this vision of this grand cathedral that's going to be coming, is going to be much more motivated and much more focused. So this morning, I want us to look at our vision, mission, and core values statement we have here at EBC. And I don't know how many of you know we have a vision, mission, and core values statement. Um, hopefully you've heard of it before and I think maybe there needs to be a better vision cast for it but um, that's what we're going to be talking about this morning so what is a vision mission and core value statement before you fall asleep from boredom it sounds kind of boring but why do we have it you know it's a plan of what we want to see happen it's a plan of how we're going to get there and how we're going to make sure we stay on course. So, you know, why is that important? Why does it matter? Why do we need a plan? You know, we as a church have, have been gifted with an incredibly important responsibility of spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ. Spreading the good news of Jesus to people around us. You know, this is the church's calling. And it's the last thing that Jesus gave us and talked to us about before he ascended to heaven. So I think it's a big responsibility that we as a church need to make sure we're fulfilling. If you turn, to me, turn with me to Matthew 28. Let's look at this. This is the Great Commission. Matthew chapter 28. And we're going to start at verse 16. is right before Jesus ascends into heaven. It says, Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When, he, when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. 
So we get, we've gotten this important calling from Jesus. I believe it's wise for us as a local church to have a plan set in place and to realize, you know, how do we want to fulfill the Great Commission here in our local community? How can we make sure we're being successful at spreading the gospel and fulfilling this calling? So what is our vision, mission, and core values? Let's go over here this morning. Our vision here at EBC, and this is the future reality that we want to see achieved. It's for Cherry Street to experience tangible evidence of God's kingdom by interacting with the family atmosphere of the local church. So that's our vision. Our mission, that's the path we believe we must take to get there. To get to that future reality is representing the kingdom of God through presence-based ministry. Inviting residents of the neighborhood into God's family through meaningful relationships and disciplining, discipling family members to follow Jesus through practical obedience to his word. And then what are our core values? These are the signposts and the guide rails along the path to keep us from straying off course. And those three are presence-based ministry, meaningful relationships, and practical obedience. So this morning, for the sermon, I want us to look at these three core values. Kind of zoom into these three core values and look at how they parallel with the life of Jesus and how he lived. When I say WWJD, what do you think? What would Jesus do? It's a very popular saying. And this morning, I want us to look at not what would Jesus do, but what did Jesus do? You know, if we want to create a plan to reach the community, if we want to create a plan to reach people for the gospel of Christ, what better person to look at than Jesus Christ himself and how he lived? Hebrews 12, 2 says, you know, fixing our eyes on Jesus, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith. So what better man to look to than Jesus Christ to walk this earth and live it out? So the first one, presence-based ministry. There's a paragraph that kind of explains each one of these um, that I'm going to read. It says, Jesus demonstrated his love for humanity by moving into our neighborhood to live out his life in our sight. We understand his love for us by his example of sacrifice. He was God with skin on. Ministering to physical, emotional, social, and spiritual needs. We understand that EBC will best represent God's kingdom by being present in the community in a daily way. We envision members of the church living on or very near Cherry Street. So what did Jesus do? You know, he lived among us. He came down from heaven, came to us. He was our neighbor. I think Philippians 2, 3 through 8 puts it well. It says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourself. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. Who being in the very nature, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself, becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. So just like Jesus lived among us, rubbed shoulders with us, and rubbed shoulders with the people he was ministering to, I believe his church should do the same. The Holy Spirit is powerful, and he can draw people to himself, and he can reach somebody through a random track. We hear stories of that, or somebody hears a good sermon, and they're um, drawn to Christ. But what better way to impact people than living with them, living among them. 
you know, where they can see your life. They can see the way you live. They have a face to what, who Jesus is. They have a face, somebody they know that's living out a Christian life. You know, Jesus knew this. That's why he came and lived among us. So they could teach us and also die for our sins. So that's what presence-based ministry is. Next one is meaningful relationships. While many experience broken relationships, we acknowledge God's sovereignty and ability to restore harmony from dissonance, order from chaos, and redemption from, self, from selfishness in our interactions with one another. By practicing kingdom values and authenticity, we believe we can experience and extend healing and restoration to broken lives. We desire that the church would feel like family should feel. So what did Jesus do? We see him building meaningful relationships. We see him stopping throughout his day to talk with people, to converse with people. An example of this is found in Luke 19. You can turn there if you'd like. Luke 19, starting at verse 1, it says, Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. Just a little background on tax collectors at this time. Um, they weren't your most... Uh, loved or beloved people, um, they would collect all the taxes. Um, but let's say if Steve owes taxes to uh, the government, I would say, Steve, um, you owe two thousand dollars in taxes. Really, he only owes owes fifteen hundred. So I'm just going to pocket the five hundred, and that's how um, he became so wealthy. So tax collectors were uh, really looked down upon. They were cheaters, swindlers, and uh, were not loved by uh, by many people. As you can understand. So a man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but being short, he could not because of the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, He has gone to be a guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anyone out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to your house, because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save what was lost. So here we see Jesus about his day, and he stops. He stops, looks up in the tree, and says to Zacchaeus, I'm coming to your house today. And he took the time out of his busy day to stop and to visit with Zacchaeus. And we see the results of that. Zacchaeus um, was saved because of it. He, he changed his ways. He gave back all that he had stolen. And Jesus says, salvation has come to your house today. So we see this example of Jesus building meaningful relationships. And able to bring, um, you know, able to take chaos and make it into um, harmony. Let's also turn to John chapter 4. John chapter 4, I'm going to start by reading verse 4 to uh, 9. Now he had to go through Samaria, so he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. 
It was about the sixth hour. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, he said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food. A Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For the Jews do not associate with the Samaritans. I'm just going to stop there. I'm not going to read this whole account. But here we see Jesus, you know, taking a break from his journey. And this woman is coming to the well to draw water. And Jesus is a Jew. This woman's a Samaritan. They didn't talk to each other. When Jesus says something to this woman, she's like, why are you even talking to me? I, and the Jews don't talk to Samaritans. And she's a woman. Men and women didn't necessarily talk or converse back in that time. It was kind of taboo. You know, you were, men were higher than women, or so they thought. So here we see Jesus taking time out of his day to ask this woman for a drink. And if we read the account, we see him having a conversation with her and asking her questions and finding out who she was, telling her, you know, all the things um, that she had done. And that's where we get to uh, verse 27. If you go to 27, um, this is kind of the end of their conversation. It says, just then the disciples returned. And we're surprised to find him talking with the woman. But no one asked, where do you where do you want or why are you talking with her? What do you want or why are you talking with her? Then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to town and said to the people, Come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Christ? So once again we see Jesus taking time out of his day to have this conversation. And we see the woman at the well. You know, turning to Christ, and you know, she believes he's the Messiah. You know, when we live among people, when we interact with people around us, when we take time our day to minister and talk with those around us, we can build these meaningful relationships. It gives us the opportunity to build these meaningful relationships, like Jesus did. Last core value is practical obedience. It says, we acknowledge the kingdom of God transcends geographical and political boundaries. And that all who choose to follow Jesus as his disciples can experience the blessings of the kingdom. We invite all to come to Jesus and challenge all to a life of discipleship. Practically following Jesus and adjusting our lifestyles, habits, and attitudes to obey him. So what do we see Jesus doing? Jesus took time to teach and disciple. You find an example of this in Mark chapter 10. You can turn there if you'd like. Mark chapter 10, verse 17. It says, as Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good, Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commands. Do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not give false testimony, do not defraud on your father and mother. Teacher, he declared. All these I have kept since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said. Go sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. At this a man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. So here you see a young man that is interested in following Jesus. He comes to him, he says, what can I do to inherit salvation? What can I do to have eternal life? And Jesus says, we've well, got to follow the commands. He says, all these, you know, all these I've done. But Jesus, it says he looked at him and loved him. And he saw in this man's heart um, an unwillingness to part from his possessions, an unwillingness um, to surrender everything for Christ. And Christ asked him, you know, are you willing to give up your possessions to follow me? 
And this wasn't exactly what the man wanted to hear. Um, I don't know you know, what was in his heart or why this was such a big thing to him, um, his possessions. But it says he went away sorrowful. But we see Jesus being willing and ready to teach people what it meant to follow him. You now here he's teaching this man, you, know, you, need, you need to surrender to follow me. Are you willing to give up the thing you love the most to follow me? So we need to be ready, you know, to teach people what it means to practically follow Jesus. We also see Jesus discipling. You know, we, he had his 12 disciples who he shared his life with. And he spent three years living life with them, teaching them, and having them watch the way he lived. Follow him and, and uh, watch how he lived. You know, he challenged them and taught them what it meant to, to follow him. So I think we also need to te teach practical obedience by asking people to follow us, to disciple people, to mentor them, asking to sit down with people and teach them what the Bible says, teach them what it means to follow God's word, teach them what it looks like to live it out. We have many examples of this. How Jesus did that with the disciples, but he's not the only example we have in Scripture. We also see the New Testament church looking at Jesus' example and doing this as well. You know, mentoring and discipling people. Acts 18, we see Aquila and Priscilla, you know, mentoring Apollos. Apollos was a young man who um, had a lot of zeal for Christ, was a great teacher. Um, and he began to speak boldly in the synagogue and to preach about Jesus. But it says in Acts 18 that when Aquila, when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they invited him to their home and explained to him the way of God more adequately. So we see them as a older couple being able to take this younger man under their wing and to teach him, you know, more adequately, adequately, you know, the things of God. We also see Paul mentoring Timothy in the New Testament. Um, there are many examples of you know, where Paul and Timothy were together, and Timothy was learning you know, from Paul. And so much so, that in 1 Corinthians um, 4, Paul says, For this reason I sent to you Timothy, my son, whom I love, who is faithful in the Lord. He will remind you all of my ways of life in Christ Jesus. So Paul had taught Timothy, and Timothy was then you know, carrying on the torch. So we see this idea of mentoring, of discipling. You know, teaching um, people what it means to follow Christ. So maybe just to wrap things up this morning. So far this morning we've been talking about the vision, mission, core values of BBC. You know, what the plan is, kind of the X's and O's, the ins and outs of the vision, mission, and values. You know, we looked specifically, kind of zoomed in at our core values, you know, meaningful relationships, our uh, presence-based ministry, meaningful relationships, and practical obedience. I think it's very important for us to have a plan set in place. Like I said, we have this great responsibility, this great calling to follow Christ and to share with others the gospel of Christ. So I think it's good that we have something that we're striving for, we're aiming for. But I think we need more than a plan set in place. We also need to be able to execute that plan. So who do we look for, to for this plan? We kind of went through the life of Jesus. And as I said, you know, we want to live our life as Jesus did. But also, how can we execute that plan? I think there's no better person to look to than Jesus for that as well. So that's kind of what part two is going to be about. Come back next week. Um, we're going to talk about the life of Jesus and look at his life. 
and how he was able to do these things. How was Jesus able to do presence-based ministry? How was he able to build these meaningful relationships? And how was he able to teach practical obedience? So we're going to kind of go into that um, next time. Let's just close with a uh, word of prayer. Dear Lord, thank you for who you are. Thank you for salvation. Thank you for your death and resurrection, that we can have newness of life living within us. And just pray that each one of us would have energy and a passion for fulfilling the Great Commission. I think we have a tremendous responsibility to share with others the good news of Jesus. I just pray that that would be our, our desire this morning. In his name, amen. Let's sing one verse about God, He is alive, to close out. There is beyond the azure blue a God concealed from human sight.